Hey everybody, Adam and Jordan here from Mental Watches. You have questions, we have answers. So we are back with another installment of questions and answers. We proposed what you guys wanted to talk about. We got a bunch of great questions and we picked out our favorite five or six of them. So without further ado, let's jump right into it. Our very first question I think is very topical. I'll let you answer first. What do you think of the new Swatch Blancpain collaboration? You know, I really think it's Swatch giving us a great example of how good they are at marketing. I would wager that Blancpain has never been Google searched more than it has this week, the tease of the reveal. Right. And I think that it is definitely the best way that the Swatch group can put new eyes on, I would say their one of their most prestigious brands in their lineup. What do I you absolutely about? agree. Like going off what you're saying, first of all, if you're new to the channel, everybody knows who's been following us for a while or following Mental Watches for a while that I'm a huge, huge fan of vintage Blancpain 50 Fathoms. I think they're the penultimate dive watch. So I'm already a huge Blancpain fan. Although the newer stuff isn't really to my taste too much because they kind of deviated away from the original. But that being said, I think any opportunity to give more eyeballs and attention to a much lesser known Swiss brand that is as great as Blancpain, because let's face it, Blancpain is only really known to like the most diehard of Swiss watch lovers and watch nerds. So any opportunity to get more people into the fold, bring more eyeballs, get more people interested in watches. And we're seeing the same thing as like we did with this Moon Swatch. Everybody hated, everybody cried about it. But at the end of the day, you had normal people getting interested in watches. Uh, how many people did we have contact us that after they bought a Moon Swatch or because of the Moon Swatch, they're interested in getting into a real Speedmaster after that. So I think it's the same thing and anything we could do to bring more attention to the watch world. And like I said, bring more people into the fold is never a bad thing. I think they made some really cool designs. I love that NORAD one. I'll try to pick one up for myself. And at the end of the day, it's not a substitute for the real thing, but it's a nice, you know, way to get your feet wet. And I think people hate just because they love to hate. No, I really like the color choices. Although some people might not agree. I think it was cool that they went outside of the box and did colors that they never did before. And I thought that doing the planets was cool and now following it up with the oceans is also really, really cool. I, I completely agree. All right, next question. Best vintage Patek under $15,000. I really want to get into vintage Patek, but I can't afford the Nautiluses and Aquanauts of the world. Any thoughts? My choice would be a simple Calatrava, I think in that price point. Off the top of my head, my favorite references, for example, are like a 3445, which is a 35 millimeter automatic with date. You can get it in yellow gold or white gold, both under 15,000. There's a lot of other great options in that price point, whether it's automatic or manual wine, but I think you're gonna have to start with a Calatrava. I was also gonna mention Calatrava, really one of the most classical watches ever made. And for under, I would even say $10,000, you can get an integrated bracelet called Trava or 96 on yellow gold. Are those still under 10,000? Yeah, 96, you could certainly find under $10,000. The only thing with the 96 is obviously at 31 millimeters. It's not to everybody's taste. So you have to be okay with wearing smaller watches, but they are probably in that category of the smaller call Travas, the most collectible and the most coveted. And so yeah, those are great options, but anything in steel or non-yellow gold will cost you more than 10,000, but you can still get a nice 96 yellow gold, 10K or under for sure. Yeah, Plus this first ask 15, so you're you're in that range regardless. To sum it up, I think Calatrava is there, right? Yeah, Calatrava is your move. Okay, next question. I put this question in here. I was really debating whether I wanted to or not. With all of the drama recently on watch YouTube, should clients reconsider consigning watches? Now, I, I know what drama they're referring to. I'm not really going to touch upon that. It's not really our world or really we're kind of a more of educational vintage category we don't really interact too much with all of that stuff that being said with the topic of consignments we don't really do a lot of consignments here we sure we have some that we take from special clients or special friends to kind of do favors and help them out i think federico federico talks watches had a really good point on this that you should always try to put yourself in a position to take less risk, i.e. sell the watch outright as opposed to consigning it, and whether that means you have to take a little bit of less money for it, so be it. But if you are steadfast on consigning a watch, just do your homework, you know, and just because you're watching somebody on YouTube, even us here, is not a substitute for doing your due diligence, making sure the people you're transacting with and doing business with are upstanding people. Read reviews online, ask other people for their, you know, opinions or experiences, and kind of just make sure you know who you're getting into bed with. Yeah, I think the most important thing on that topic is just because somebody has a YouTube channel does not mean that they're reputable in the business. So I would definitely do your homework. You know, we always say buy the dealer, 
you have to definitely know who you're dealing with. Don't go with somebody just because they have a YouTube channel. Right, just because there's flashy social media is not uh, an excuse to just jump in bed and do business with that person. Right. Okay, we touched upon that. Moving on, I thought this was an interesting question. I see dealers advertising modern watches as unpolished. Is that a thing and how important is it? It's important to an extent just to know the life that your modern watch has lived. Do I see it as impacting the value? Let's say if we're talking about Rolex, like a, an unpolished vintage Submariner versus, you know, a brand new 126610 that was polished or unpolished? No, because the difference is, is that there's a lot of minutia in the vintage watches. They were hand cut watches. The bevels are very specific and distinct, which is why people like them unpolished. And there's a lot of variants that go into the condition of those watches, whereas all of the modern watches are produced exactly the same. So does it matter as much? It might affect the value a little bit, but not as much as on a vintage watch. And in my opinion, it's not as important as long as the watch was polished correctly and it looks really nice. It's not as big of a deal because like I said, all these modern watches, they kind of all look the same and we're not really assessing whether one is unpolished or polished to kind of find which watch is in better condition and which has more distinct characteristics as if it left the factory since they all look the same. Any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, just make sure the watch isn't over polished. I've seen a lot of examples in the vintage and the modern side where people don't know what they're doing. They'll bring their watch to a mom and pop jeweler who are just like, yeah, we'll polish it. Fell asleep and, on the polishing wheel. <laughs> yeah, and, and they'll turn like a satin finish into a full high polish finish. And, you know, I would stay away from that stuff. Obviously use your best judgment on that. But, you know, it does affect the value only if it's done poorly. Right. I, I think it's a lot of dealers just trying to capitalize on the fervor for unpolished watches in the vintage sphere and trying to carry that over into the more contemporary watches. I don't think it's as big of a deal and I don't think it nearly holds as much uh, importance in terms of the value of the watch like it does in vintage land. Okay, next question, which is another topical question. What are your thoughts on the Booker acquisition? They're talking about Rolex acquiring Booker. Any thoughts? Yeah, in a business sense, I think it's a good move for them. I think it's very uncharacteristic of Rolex to do this. Rolex has shown a pattern of making small incremental increases in their prices. You know, they're the kind of people who they don't really care about revenue. And I think that while it is good business practice, practice for them. It's just a way for them to control the market a little bit better with their use. They're now certified pre-owned program and their new watches as well. I would have to go on a limb and say that Booker is one of the largest retailers of new Rolex. Right. Would you agree with that? Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of people are making much ado about nothing and they're signaling end times and it's going to be more difficult to get a watch now, which would already was difficult, although it's been softening up. I've heard plenty of of stories of people going in with no purchase history and ordering a back roll and getting it a month later, whatever. I don't think this really has any immediate impact, especially in the United States, for example, because most of the ADs are independently owned, although the Rolex has been trying to go direct to retail, but they're not just going to cut out watches in Switzerland. They're not going to mm. cut out all of those ADs right away because they'd have to open up brokers here in the United States. And planning all that infrastructure is going to take a long time. So it might happen in the future where Rolex kind of keeps a stranglehold on all of their distribution, which they probably should have done a long time ago. I don't see it going into effect anytime soon. And I think all of the you know, people getting crazy about it is is really kind of like the Swatch stuff, people just getting crazy for no reason. I'm sure it'll have some impact. I'm sure it was a smart business move for Rolex. Is it going to have any immediate impact on us as purchasers, collectors, uh, dealers? Probably not. The only way I could see it having impact is if Booker changes the certified pre-owned program completely and lowering the prices on those and making them more competitive to the gray market dealers. That's the only way I see it, you know, being a problem. Yeah, in that, the... As it stands, the CPO prices that I've seen online, at least have been way above gray market pricing. And, and listen, if you're the client who likes, you know, feel better about buying a watch that's CPO'd because it has their warranty and it has an extra new service card or a new warranty card or whatever they're giving you, then that's great. That's your prerogative. And, you know, everybody's different. Every buyer's different. And I, I agree with you 100% that if they could find a way to, average out that price so it's closer to gray market, then it might start having a bigger impact on gray market dealers in particular. I just don't see them doing that anytime soon. Yeah. I mean, like you said, Rolex does things very slowly and incrementally. So right. this is probably just to beef up their portfolio at some point 
make a switch more direct to consumer. Right. And our last question that I pulled out, I guess more of a quasi personal one, gentleman says, I want to start trading in vintage watches. How did you get started and any advice you can share? So uh, I think my story is pretty well known, but I will rehash it here. I was a collector of modern watches and started getting interested in vintage watches when I worked overseas. I'm a licensed attorney, although I haven't practiced in about a decade now. As I would visit home during the summer months and you know holidays, I would buy a small vintage watch, do a ton of reading, get more and more into it. And then finally, I made my first big vintage purchase, which is I traded a Panerai and an Adam Piguet Royal Oak offshore for a vintage Daytona reference 6262, which was well under 30 grand at the time. After that, it kind of just set off a fire in me and I you know, consumed all content material that I could. It got to a point where I was just so obsessed with watches that people were coming to me for advice and I decided to start selling watches on the side to kind of build up my own collection and afford my own watches. And then it kind of transformed as my wife got pregnant with our first child and kind of made it a more official business. And then I stopped practicing law to do this full time. My advice would be to take your time. I was very fortunate because I was able to start the business while I still had a real nine to five to fall back on. So it wasn't as pressing for me to make a sale. I wasn't relying on it to support my family. Um, I was able to build the business up while still doing that before making my transition. I was very fortunate. I, I understand that most people don't have that opportunity. I think the best advice I can give is A, be honest, B, do your homework, get your education, make sure you know what you're selling, take your time and don't try. And I guess lastly, which corresponds to the, the second part, don't try to do everything at once. I see a lot of people make the mistake that they think they need to take out some big loan or get some backer to buy a you know, million dollars worth of inventory all at once. I started with the three or four watches uh, in my personal collection that I didn't really care about at the time. And I think 20 grand. And I slowly but surely built that up, selling watches, you know, just continue, continue, continue. And I didn't take out a line of credit from my bank, uh, which is a small line of credit, until I was five years into the business, I think. And so just take your time and make sure you know what you're doing. Any other advice? Yeah, I got started because I was gifted a watch and that watch made me Google watches. And, you know, I was reading all the blogs. I was consuming all the watch content that I could. And I was like, okay, how can I make this my my job and uh, I started working at a watch repair store that made you know my interest even higher uh, just being around watches and give you a good base um, of knowledge for right. you know having experience handling watch I think that's right. the key thing is having the experience there's you could read everything you want on the internet watch as many YouTube videos as you want but having hands-on experience day in day out is immeasurable i think most definitely and you know my advice is you know reach out to as many watch dealers as you can and make your name out you know put your name out there for the most part everyone in this community is very very nice very very welcoming i think that the majority of the community will try to help you succeed i don't think anybody wants to see somebody fail so i would reach out to as many people as i can you know go on your favorite instagrams and just dm those those dealers and whatnot um build those relationships and i you know like Adam said, don't you don't have to start off with the whole boat, you know, buy one, two, three watches to start. And when you sell those, you know, right. turn one to two to two to three and then and so on. So on. And, and to your point, I, I, a good friend of mine, another vintage watch dealer, gave me some invaluable advice when I was getting started out. He said to start and you don't have to follow this, although, in my opinion, he was right to start out. You should be considering doing about 90 percent wholesale, 10 percent retail. And the reason is because the retail clients, it takes years to build up your name, reputation, et cetera, to get those retail clients. But to do business with a dealer, anybody who messages me who wants to sell us a watch or messages you, I, I don't care who they are. If I like the watch, I'll buy it for stock, we'll buy it. So, you know, selling to other dealers and doing wholesale allows you to A, sell quickly and B, turn your money quicker. Yes, you'll make less money than you would selling it at a retail location or, or to a retail client, but you will be able to get in and out of that watch quicker and you know get more experience handling and selling watches at a much faster pace and afford you the ability to go out and then buy more inventory after you've sold it. So I think it's a good way to start, yeah. but first and foremost, you know, make sure you know what you're doing, get experience, get knowledge, and always be honest and always be trustworthy. It takes a lifetime to build your reputation and only one bad deal to ruin it. So always keep that in mind and put your best foot forward. 
Anyways, I think that is it. I capped it at those six questions. If you guys enjoyed this video, please always do us a favor, like, comment, subscribe, anything you can do to help us grow the channel. In addition, there is still time to enter our free Rolex giveaway. We are giving away an amazing mosaic dial Rolex date just. When we hit 10,000 subscribers as a way to celebrate, all you need to do is subscribe to the channel and watch that video and comment on your favorite watch that we discussed in that video. We will link it below as well. And there's still time to enter. So go ahead and give it your best shot. Good luck, everybody. And as always, thank you for watching. Bye. Take care.